Elisa Mackey, CEO of the PADS program, and we'll be taking a deeper dive into how the view of constructed emotion addresses the first of the five SEL capacities, self-awareness. Let's review a little bit about the classical versus the constructionist view of the brain. You're probably familiar with the classical view of emotions in the brain, which has informed social and emotional learning to date. This view holds that there are specific areas of the brain that are involved in emotions, specifically the prefrontal cortex, hypothalamus, and the amygdala. These areas of the brain work in concert. The amygdala reacts to the emotions that we are experiencing and sends a signal to the hypothalamus, triggering a physical response. This release of hormones is responsible for the body's response, specifically in instances of fear, such as an increased heartbeat or dilated pupils. This theory, often referred to as flight or flight, was first identified in the 1920s. While this theory was first thought to help people to perform better in stressful situations, one caveat is that it's not always accurate. It's easy for your brain to get tricked. For instance, walking through the woods and spotting a branch that you mistake for a snake. And it doesn't take into account human variation and cultural differences. Specifically, the fact that all people are different. What makes one person feel scared, such as visiting a haunted house, may make another person feel exhilarated. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for thinking and problem solving and planning. The major job often attributed to the prefrontal cortex is to calm the amygdala down in these fight or flight situations. Once calm, self-regulation can occur. The classical view suggests that people have difficulty exercising self-control, that their emotions can hijack their behaviors. However, we now know that people can, in fact, maintain control of the way they react to their feelings and emotions. The classical view of the brain also holds that there are specific facial expressions and body language that corresponds to various emotions, and that they are all universal in nature. For people to truly be effective in interpersonal interactions, it is our responsibility to learn how to read these expressions to understand their meaning. This understanding of the brain and how it works comes from the science of neurobiology. With the advent of improved imaging with functional magnetic resonating imagery, or fMRI, we now know this classical view of the working of the brain to be false, based on stereotypes, misinterpretation of results, faulty research design, or the inability to replicate the results. These new findings have led to a new view of emotions at the brain called constructionism. The theory of constructed emotion holds that the entire brain is involved in emotions, as well as the body. Today, new research shows us that the brain does not compartmentalize itself into these discrete areas. Instead, the brain uses information from the body, past experiences, and the current situation to construct our view of the world and inform our emotions. This is the constructionist view of the brain. In Lisa Feldman Barrett's groundbreaking book, How Emotions Are Made, she explains that emotions do not have specific locations in the brain from which they are generated. Instead, fMRI machines show that these connections take place across the brain. It is more efficient for the brain to use many sets of neurons to produce the same outcome, and that any single neuron can contribute to more than one outcome. This kind of brain is more robust, using its power efficiently and flexibly. From the moment the brain perceives sensations from the body, it begins to attempt to categorize this information. These categories are called concepts. The entire purpose of the brain is to help maintain the body, or the body budget, and it keeps it in balance, not too cold, not too hot, not too hungry, not too thirsty, etc. The information that the brain receives from the body is called interoception, which is information from the senses that the brain interprets into concepts. Language is an important part of concept formation, which represents past experiences. As more concepts are formed, the brain begins to predict based on the interoceptive information and the context or situation in which you find yourself. 
These concepts are how the brain makes meaning of all the sensations and inputs it receives. Sometimes the prediction of meaning is an emotion, like happy, sad, or mad. Contrary to popularly held beliefs, emotions do not have markers or specific recognizable universal facial features. Take the experience of happy, for instance. Sometimes we smile. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes we show nothing on our face to indicate to others how we are feeling. When we say we're happy, we're not experiencing all the kinds of happiness that can be experienced. We are experiencing one example of happiness, or an instance of the happy emotion. To say that happy is experienced in only one way is incorrect because we have felt happy in many different situations. The brain is predicting the sort of happy concept that it thinks is appropriate in that moment, and it does it so rapidly that we do not perceive this guessing game at work. In education, we hear the phrase teaching the whole child. The organization Whole Child Education sets out five tenets. Each student enters school healthy and learns about and practices a healthy lifestyle. Each student learns in an environment that is physically and emotionally safe for students and adults. Each student is actively engaged in learning and is connected to the school and the broader community. Each student has access to personalized learning and is supported by qualified, caring adults. And each student is challenged academically and prepared for success in college or further study and for employment and participation in a global environment. And I think the constructionist view of emotion is more in line with this focus of teaching than the classical view. Number one, the construction includes the body and the mind. Our emotions are directly influenced by our body budget and our body budget is directly related to our thinking and emotions. They are not separate things. In fact, the entire purpose of the brain is to keep the body alive and functioning. A healthy lifestyle of proper nutrition, exercise and sleep is crucial to maintaining our body budget. Number two, physical and emotional safety takes into consideration the importance of both the body and the mind and the inability to separate them into discrete parts. Number three, engagement and connection to school and community recognizes that we are social creatures and positive relationships can lead to the regulation of our body budget, which in turn impacts more positively our brain's predictions. And number four, supported by qualified caring adults, recognizes the importance of relationships and that education is not just an education of the mind. Social emotional learning encompasses five capacities, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship management, and responsible decision-making. Let's see how this new view of the brain and emotions connects. Beginning with self-awareness, CASEL, or the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, defines it as the ability to identify one's emotions, maintain an accurate and positive self-concept, recognize individual strengths, and experience a sense of self-efficacy. There are several issues to address when thinking about what the research says regarding self-awareness. First, what is the self? The constructionist view says that the self is really just another concept like any other concept from which the brain uses to make its predictions. You might remember that a concept is our brain's way of making meaning of our experiences and the world. The self-concept might be made up of a number of characteristics, such as your likes and dislikes, roles and responsibilities that you have, the choices that you make, your values, morals, and beliefs, your appearance, your cultural identity, and many other characteristics. A common core runs through all of these views. The self is your sense of who you are, and it's continuous through time, as if it were the essence of you, Dr. Barrett says. Now that you have a sense of yourself, the other thing to note is that it really doesn't exist in isolation. We need other people to help define the self because our brain makes its predictions taking into account our interactions with other people how they treat us, what they say or do not say. Our actions are dependent on these instances. Our predictions are based on the concepts that we have, which are created from our past experiences. So our interactions with others are necessary to help us define the self. The guidelines in which we operate, our do's and don'ts, 
our preferences and habits. Essentially, our self-concept is created by a combination of our past experiences, the information from our body, which is interoception, and the current situation from which our brain makes its predictions. This, of course, includes our interactions with others. Essentially, our self is our past, our present, and our future. The next thing we need to consider is something called affect. Affect is our general overall feeling. It is comprised of the feelings of pleasant versus unpleasant and calm versus agitated or aroused. This occurs based on the interoceptive information, which you might remember is the information that comes from the body and which the brain is perceiving and making predictions based on this body information. So, affect is your general overall feeling based on the information from the body. It's a summary of whether your body budget is in balance or overdrawn, in the red or in the black, so to speak. This information from the body is sent to the brain for processing and the brain predicts the body's needs in order to survive, which begins even before birth and continues until death. This means that affect is with us our entire lives and is a fundamental part of who we are and the concept of ourself. One other thing to consider is our emotion concepts. We perceive emotional experiences because of our emotion concepts. If we do not have a robust conceptual system, our ability to perceive emotion is seriously diminished. The more specificity in emotion concepts that we possess, the more choices we have for prediction, categorization, and perceiving of emotions. We have more options at our disposal for our brain to predict more effective responses. Emotional intelligence is about getting your brain to construct the most useful instance of the most useful emotion concept in a given situation, and also when not to construct emotions but instances of some other concepts. So to help our brain have more choices, we need to gain more concepts, and the easiest way to gain concepts is to learn new emotion words, because the creation of concepts is strongly linked to language. Each emotion word is connected to that emotion concept from which the brain can use to predict instances of emotion. But if there is no concept, then there is no opportunity to predict that emotional experience. Concepts are like tools in a tool belt, and if you don't have the tool, you can't use it. So increasing your emotional vocabulary is like adding tools to the tool belt. Emotional granularity is being able to label and define an emotional experience and determine how that experience is different from another similar type of experience. Let's take for example the difference between disappointed and discouraged. Knowing the definition of these words is important, but knowing the difference and being able to distinguish between the two using your own experiences is what is important. The differences are subtle, but having emotional granularity means being able to know how they are different and apply those differences when determining how you feel about a situation. There are approximately 3,000 emotion words in the English language. How many do you know and use? Learning new emotion words in other languages also helps to develop our emotion concepts. Encourage your students from other cultures to share emotion words from their native languages and the definitions. Challenge your students to use these new words in the course of their conversations. Similarly, making up new words for an experience and sharing the definition with others and using these new words also creates new concepts from which predictions can be made. Challenge your students to create new emotion words for their experiences. Words enter our language because someone made them up. To find them, shared them, and others identified with them and began using them. One new word that has entered our conversation is the word hangry, a feeling of irritation and upset due to feeling hungry. This word clearly links the physical experience and its emotional impact on our emotional experiences. As you might remember, interoception is the information from the body sent to the brain and from which predictions are made. Physical health is crucial to this process. Ensuring that schools provide nutritious lunches and snack options, providing a variety of appealing physical activities, and encouraging a reasonable balance between work and play essentially promotes a balanced lifestyle is important for well-being. Journaling helps to focus on the positive aspects of life and work. 
providing opportunities for reflection and introspection with journaling prompts. Journaling, when focused on gratitude, helps us to think about and savor the things in our life that are good. Research tells us that focusing on journaling can help improve adjustment to changes in our lives, life satisfaction, and improve sense of gratitude. It just might promote improved writing skills too. Mindfulness has a direct effect on well-being, self-regulation, and more positive emotional states. Incorporating mindfulness practices regularly into the school day also helps to improve self-awareness. Mindfulness can be considered to enhance attention to and awareness of current experiences or present reality, and a core characteristic of mindfulness is described as an open or receptive awareness and attention during present events or experiences. Research suggests that mindfulness can enhance self-knowledge, which is a key component of self-regulation, which is a topic we'll tackle on our next session. When dealing with challenging decisions, provide a supportive structure to solve problems. Students can benefit by being taught a universal method to solve their problems that is used in all classrooms. Focusing on a growth mindset is also helpful. Having a way to solve problems helps students avoid rumination Focusing on why things went wrong over and over increases the chances that the brain will choose predictions that might be perceived as more unpleasant in nature. Thinking about what went wrong and figuring out how to do better the next time, we focus the brain on more positive outcomes, increasing our chances that future predictions will be more pleasant. Relationships are the foundation of teaching and an analysis of 46 studies found that strong relationships between teachers and students were associated with improved student engagement, attendance, grades, there were fewer disruptive behaviors and suspensions, and lower dropout rates. But for teachers, building relationships with their students might not be all that intuitive. One way to support teachers in relationship building is to encourage them to have conversations that are compassionate and honest about their feelings. Encourage staff to get in touch with their own feelings and learn how to have discussions about emotions. This is a challenge for many teachers because in our teaching education programs, this is not a topic that we talk about, how to emotion coach our students. For more information on emotion coaching training, contact us at PADS program. Finally, a program that addresses these topics in a developmentally appropriate way is incredibly helpful. It will provide a structure to have these types of conversations, teach specific skills, and provide practice to encourage skill acquisition. At PAS Program, we have evidence-based, award-winning programs to help you implement SEL easily and effectively in your school, from preschool right up to grade 8. For more information, please visit our website or reach out to set up a time to discuss your SEL needs. Thank you for taking the time to view our presentation on self-awareness and the constructionist view of emotion. Stay tuned for our next segment in the series, Self-Management and Construction, where we'll explore this new understanding of the brain and self-control. Thank you so much for your time.